This morning I'd like to uh, speak to you about World War I and uh, I don't like to glorify war um, in terms of our family, uh, Lynn's dad, Laurie, and her mum, Jean, is here today. Welcome, Jean, my, uh, my mother-in-law and the best one I ever had. She saved my marriage four times and uh, I only asked her three times. So I appreciate that. So in terms of World War I, uh, I don't like glorifying war, but if anything good can come out of it, I'd like to, to uh, share that with you. I'd like you to read this text with me uh, on the screen. It's in John 15, 13. Read with me. Jesus said, Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Now, I'm actually not going to be speaking about that today, but in the story I will tell you, after the truce finished, a man did go out into the middle ground, uh, believing the truce was still on, and he was shot dead. So it's interesting that many, many bad things happen in war, and not so many good things happen in war, so let us celebrate the good things that happen. Well, with that introduction, I'd like to begin, and I'd like to talk to the Lord. Let us pray. In the name, power, and authority of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, King of kings and Lord of lords, we come before you today, Lord, with praise and thanksgiving. You are an awesome God, and it's a privilege to know you through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Father in heaven, we ask the Holy Spirit's power upon us today to keep us awake, to help us to see beyond the story into the meaning of the story. Help us to feel convicted by the Holy Spirit in those parts that are relevant to our life and those parts that we don't think are relevant to our life. Thank you for 2023, the gift of life and health and strength. Thank you for the trials. Thank you for the blessings. And right now we are opening ourselves to the power of the Holy Spirit that we might be lifted up to the throne room of heaven. We ask you cleanse us from sin, put us under the blood of Jesus, make us totally right with you as we luxuriate in your grace and your mercy. In Jesus' powerful name, amen. This is the claim. The claim is that German and British frontline soldiers sang carols, exchanged gifts, and played soccer during a World War I Christmas truce. Is this true? Well, during World War I, in the winter time of 1914, on the battlefields of Flanders, one of the most unusual events in all of human history took place. The Germans had been in a fierce battle versus the British and the French. Both sides were dug in, safe in muddy man-made trenches six to eight feet deep that seemed to stretch on to forever. All of a sudden, German troops began to put small Christmas trees lit with candles outside their trenches. So they must have come prepared. Then they began to sing songs. Across the way, in the no man's land between them, came songs from the British and the French troops, incredibly, many of the Germans who had worked in England before the war were able to speak good enough English to propose a Christmas truce. It was the night of Thursday, December 24th, in the year of our Lord, 1914. The British and French troops all along the miles of trenches accepted the truce. In a few places, Allied troops fired at the Germans as they climbed out of their trenches. But the Germans were persistent, and I do love that about the Germans. They're very persistent. They get the job done. I'm half German. And Christmas would be celebrated even under the threat of impending death. Got to love that commitment. Well, according to Daniel Stanley Weintraub, who wrote about this event in his book, Silent Night, Signboards arose up and down the trenches in a variety of shapes. They were usually in English or from the Germans in fractured English. 
Rightly, the Germans assumed that the other side could not read traditional Gothic lettering and that few English understood spoken German. So here was the main message. You will not fight, we not fight. Some British units improvised Merry Christmas banners and waited for a response. More placards on both sides popped up. A spontaneous truce resulted. Soldiers left their trenches meeting in the middle to shake hands. The first order of business was to bury the dead who'd been previously unreachable because of the conflict. Then they exchanged gifts, chocolate cake, cognac, postcards, newspapers, tobacco. In a few places along the trenches, soldiers exchanged rifles for soccer balls and began to play games. Well, it didn't last forever. In fact, some of the generals didn't like it at all and commanded their troops to resume shooting at each other. After all, they were in a war. The soldiers eventually did resume shooting at each other, but only after, in a number of cases, a few days of wasting rounds of ammunition, shooting at stars in the sky instead of soldiers in the opposing army across the field. Well, that is the story that some have heard and believed, and they've believed that it was only a fanciful myth or a legend. But what are its real and truthful origins? Well, of the British and German soldiers who faced each other across the muddy fields of Flanders on Christmas Eve 1914, even those who no longer believed the optimistic predictions of a short war would have been shocked to learn it would drag on for another four years and ultimately would see the staggering totals of eight and a half million men dead and 21 million wounded. To understand what was happening in the trenches, allow me to read you this emotive poem from Lieutenant Colonel John McRae, Canadian Army Surgeon. And you know what? He had been in the Boer War, and he'd seen so much killing and trying to put men blown apart back together again that he had had enough. And so let's have a look at what he wrote. In Flanders fields, the poppies blow between the crosses, row on row. That mark our place, and in the sky the lark still bravely singing fly. Scarce heard amid the guns below, we are the dead short days ago. We lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders' fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe, to you from failing hands we throw the torch, be yours to hold it high. If you break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders' fields. You can feel the pain and the loss and the grief in those words. Well, by December 1914, the European war, nonetheless being fought by men who were weary, frustrated, and dispirited, bogged down in the glue-like muck, waterlogged trenches and barbed wire entanglements of Belgium with little sense of national purpose other than to defeat the enemy, had already claimed hundreds of thousands of casualties since the beginning of hostilities in the early August of 1914. Despite the constant machine gun fire and artillery bombardments of the Western Front, and even though in some places frontline troops were a mere 60 yards away from the enemy lines, soldiers on both sides received gift boxes containing food, tobacco and ladies' chocolate. <laughs> Prepared by their governments that Christmas. 
Well, the Germans, who had a direct land link to their home country, survived a lot better, while the British soldiers in Belgium were separated from London by 60 miles in the English Channel. Also managed to send small Christmas trees and candles to troops at the front. And notwithstanding the fact that a Christmas ceasefire proposed by Pope Den Benedict XV, who had asked that, may the guns fall silent at least upon the night the angels sang. Well, this idea had already been rejected by both sides as impossible. Well, on Christmas Eve, the law of anticipated consequences went to work. Here is how Stanley Weintraub, author of Silent Night, the story of World War I, Christmas Truce, described it. He said, the Germans set trees on trench parapets and lit the candles. Then they began singing carols, and though their language was unfamiliar to their enemies, the tunes were not. After a few trees were shot at, as you do, the British became more curious than belligerent and crawled forward to watch and listen. And after a while, they began to what? They began to sing. Then they were joined by another voice, this one singing in German. The words of a hymn known and beloved by all. Together they were singing in English, German and French these famous words, sleep in heavenly peace, sleep in heavenly peace. Well, by then the hymn Silent Night was a hundred years old. That it was familiar and beloved by men on both sides of the line was no surprise. Silent Night was known around Europe and was sung by many languages for absolute generations. By Christmas morning, the no man's land between the trenches was filled with fraternizing soldiers, sharing rations and gifts, singing, and more solemnly, burying their dead between the lines. Soon they were even playing football, I should say football, mostly with improvised soccer balls. According to the official war diary of the 133rd Saxon Regiment, Tommy and Fritz, Tommy and Fritz, you know, I love the Germans, they've even got the pointy helmets so that their men didn't shoot at them because the helmets can look similar in war, so the pointy ones don't shoot at the pointy ones. And the English like, point it, hit the, if you just hit behind that, just below that, you'll be right. So, Tommy and Fritz kicked about a real football supplied by a Scot. We didn't know the Scot were so into football, but they are. This developed into a regulation football match with caps usually laid, casually laid out as goals. The frozen ground was no great matter. The game ended 3-2 for Fritz. Yay, the Germans. This spontaneous truce, which included French and Belgian troops in some sectors, was largely over by New Year's Day. However, commanders on both sides ordered their troops to restart hostilities under penalty of court-martial, and German and British soldiers reluctantly parted. In the words of Private Percy Jones of the Westminster Brigade, with much handshaking and mutual goodwill. The Great War stretched on through another three Christmases and beyond, but all subsequent attempts to organize similar truces failed, and the tragedy of war is millions more died. For the armistice of the 11th of November, 1918, finally ended the shooting for good. As writer Stanley Weintraub noted in the close of his book on the 1914 Christmas truce, however much the momentary peace of 1914 evidenced the desire of the combatants to live in amity with one another, it was doomed from the start by the realities beyond the trenches. As the English rock band, The Farm, decades later, summed up the results after the enemies joined together and decided not to fight, but failed, there was nothing learned and nothing gained. 
I was reading last night online that an atheist got onto one of these uh, blogs and said, so all the Christians kept Chris Christmas and then the day after went back to murdering their fellow men. And someone had an answer under that, but they were just following orders. And there's a whole nother sermon for another time. The ethics of war is that an oxymoron, the ethics of war. It's kind of like military intelligence, an oxymoron. Well, a celebration of the human spirit, the Christmas truce remains a moving manifestation of the absurdities of war. A very minor Scottish poet of Great War vintage, Frederick Niven, may have got it right in his A Carol from Flanders, which closed with these amazing words as a challenge. O ye who read this truthful rhyme, from Flanders kneel and say, God speed the time when every day shall be as Christmas Day. What do you say? Although the Christmas truce of 1914 may seem like a distant myth to those now at arms in parts of the world where vast Cultural differences between combatants make such an occurrence impossible. It remains a symbol of hope to those who believe that a recognition of our common humanity may someday reverse the maxim that peace is harder to make than war. Any idiot can start a war. So, friends... For a few precious moments on December 24, 1914, there was peace on earth. And as some of you said this morning, goodwill to all men, to all mankind, to all humankind. All because the focus was on Christmas, the day of Christ's birth, and it seems to happen in different places every time. There's something about Christmas that changes people. It happened over 2,000 years ago in a little town called Bethlehem. It's been happening over and over again down through the years of time. This week, Lord willing, it will happen again, or maybe I should say the week after. I believe Christmas is in about 10 days' time. Friends, you may be asking yourself this morning, what does this ancient battlefront story have to do with you and your family at Christmas, for we are far from war. So my question comes to you at point blank range. Are some family members or even families not at war? People generally are hurting, broken, discouraged, fearful, nervous, feeling under attack from the enemy. And some individuals will be missing from the Christmas table. To use the good Aussie vernacular here, I ask you, what about your mob? Hmm? When you meet with your friends and families this Christmas or Boxing Day, I'm asking you to consider taking three redemptive spiritual actions. Now, this is the hard part. We've had the easy part. This is the hard part. This is the application of the lesson. Number one, I'm going to ask you to greet as many of them as you can with words of love and a warm handshake or embrace. It's easy to say, but can be very hard to act out. Why is that? All right, let's get the rubber on the road and stop talking about airy fairy dreams and let's talk what normally happens at Christmas time. Well, there are usually one or two lines uttered by a relative that you know that will drive you mad every time you hear it or you will see them. Can I think of one example? No, I can think of three. If they're true, start laughing. Number one, hey, you look like you need to lose some weight. Or 
you see a young person at Christmas and you say, hey, what's going on with you? You're not married yet. Listen, son, let me give you a tip. All the fine china is left on the high shelf when all the mugs are taken. Now, no pressure. You be married next time. I'll see you in a year's time at next Christmas. Or, hey, why can't your kids behave as well as your sister's kids? Your kids are just brats that fell. They're humping my leg. What's going on? So what are you going to do about that? I've thought about this. I haven't asked Gary about this, but I hope I'm somewhere near the truth. With a counsellor, with a friend, or a... I said tape recorder. <laughs> Let's just translate that as your phone. Take a few minutes several days ahead of any family gathering to practice hearing the one or two most guilt-inducing or shaming phrases that your difficult relative tends to say to you or someone you love. Then practice deep breathing. In, uh, staying calm and responding with clarity, compassion and firmness to their worst remarks by saying something like, and quote me verbatim, I appreciate your concern. I'll let you know as soon as I have any good news to report back to you on that issue. Now let's get back to the reason we're all gathered here for this special event. Friends, I want to tell you that when we used to have Christmas parties as a family, this is a whole lot of noise. And as you get older, you can't actually hear people in a noisy room. So you get into this kind of thing of faking it till you make it like, yeah, yeah, mm, yep. And you'll say, yep, yep, that's great. And they'll say, but I just said my uncle died. And you're like, oh, no, no, I meant no, that's bad. All right, so what I would do is I'd select somebody that maybe I needed to build a relationship with, and I'd say to them, do you want to go down the swing bridge? And they'd be like, no. And say, yes, you do. So why? I've got something to tell you. Oh, okay, so I'd take them outside, walk them down the street at mum and dad's, and there was a little bridge across there, and I'd talk to them on the bridge. And then when I was sick of them, I'd bring them back and take someone else. And you know what? You can build relationships with people and you can spend time with people one-on-one -on -one because you can go to a room full of people and not connect with anyone. Is that right? All right. There's a song. Harry Chapin, was it? Everybody's talking at me. I don't hear a word they say. Number two. Celebrate. Sorry. Number two, seek out the wounded. Some of the people at your Christmas party are so terribly hurt in the inevitable battles of family warfare over the cold years of time, they're in bad shape. And you know what? Hurt people, hurt people. You got it? Hurt people, hurt people. These poor souls might not even be attending your party time. But you as a Christian, a follower of Jesus, can still minister to them with cards, texts, emails, phone calls, or even a lovely visit. Take a small gift showing you care. Seek out the wounded. Don't shoot them. They're already in bad shape. Don't shoot them. Number three, celebrate a moment in time and speak for God and stop the war. Tell your friends and family they're loved by God and that he can bring healing to their wounded hearts and lives. Take a risk. Make a speech. Be passionate. Be positive. Don't be yourself at Christmas. Be a Christian. It may be the last time you'll be all together in exactly the same formation of people. Now, I was invited to a home in Port Macquarie during the week with Lynn and my son, and we were looking out over the ocean and it was an absolutely beautiful view. And someone in that house told me that they had called their family member and met with them during the week. And old hurts and the war were put behind them and awesome progress was made. They got to meet 
brothers and sisters, they got to meet the grandchildren, which was off limits, and all they had to do was say, you know what, I want to end the war with you, and I want to reach out to you, and I want to, want to spend time with you, and I want to make what's wrong right, and I want to make what's broken heal. And somebody else told me a few weeks ago that they'd done this, and it's bearing fruit. Friends, you can't do it at the funeral service. You'll be crying like a baby, but that time frame has gone. It's over. It's finished. And it'll just be between you and yourself, and you will carry the heavy burden. Let me tell you, you will carry the heavy burden for years unless you can learn to resolve that. And most people never get over a death where there's unresolved pain. So I want you to think about that very seriously. This is the Price family 10 years ago in the Christmas of 2013. We were all together in Queensland at my parents' house and it was for my dad's sister, Auntie Shirley's birthday and my dad's brother, Uncle Howard's birthday and my dad's birthday. And right now, Auntie Shirley, Uncle Howard and my dad have all gone. And those days are gone. And I am now the patriarch of the family with that mob. And that is a very scary thought. So friends, my mum and dad are now gone. And I cannot speak with them again ever in this life. There are things I never got to say to them. Both. There are things I think of asking them every day. I'd like to tell my dad, Dad, I'm actually interested in the family tree. When in the past, I've fobbed that off to Lynn. Dad said, David, why aren't you interested in the family tree? Yet? I said, Dad, too many monkeys. Sorry, can't handle it. Friends, the time for talking and loving is ended. I'm asking you to not make the same mistake. If you've still got family that you love, let them know. May your family gathering be a truly happy and spiritual Christmas day. How will that happen? It will only happen if you plan it and you start praying about it now and you lay some concrete plans. Now, some of you are going to say, now listen, Aunt Jemima, you've got no idea when she comes into the house, it's like Twister, it's like a nightmare, she just brings the whole place down. You can neutralise her before she comes in with all her gloom and doom. You can send her a card or send her some flowers or a gift box. That'll really mess her up because people who are nasty and Pharisees, they don't really like gifts. And even though when the gift comes, I'll be very suspicious that you want to get in their will or something, but you will have their attention. And then the next time you talk to them, they'll be thinking, i got to get out of you while you sent me that thing. And just draw it out. Don't let them know. Draw it out. Put them on, on ice and just prepare their hearts for the reconciliation. Prepare their hearts because this can be a happy, happy time. Always remember, as I said to Lizzie, that without Jesus, there's no reason for the season. Now, friends, in terms of the Christmas truce, I don't promote movies, but I found, to my surprise on YouTube, that some of these movies are on there talking about the Christmas truce. And that one, Joy O Noel, Merry Christmas, is actually online, I think the whole hour and a half, so you can watch it on YouTube. And I want to tell you, if you go in there and watch them, then that will bring the sentiment of enemies laying down arms on Christmas. Now, I'm going to end off with a little treat for you. I actually have a little video clip, and we're going to take you into the story that I just shared. Now, the funniest thing is that this video clip comes from a major supermarket chain in England who do the most amazing Christmas advertisements. And some of you might know, and I've shopped there when I lived in England for 12 months in 1980, 
someone might know the name Sainsbury's. And so that's what I'm going to show you. Thank you, John, for the lights. And we'll go for lights and sound now. This is only about three or four minutes. Don't miss it.
You're all blessed today because you've come to my shortest sermon. People of discernment. Well, we'd have to finish. What are you guys crying for? We'd have to finish with this, wouldn't we? I think that's what we're going to do. Thank you so much to the Musos. I love that we have a band here at Camden. And for those of you who are visitors, we have Sabbath school at 11 o'clock. We might be able to even start a little bit earlier today. And we have a fellowship lunch. We're so glad that you are here with us. And we pray that you will be blessed and be a blessing. Silent night, holy night. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, Jesus Christ, our Saviour and Holy Spirit. Father, we want to thank you that since Jesus died on the cross, the war is really over. And the kingdom of heaven has won. But still the enemy is, uh, although he's a defeated foe, he doesn't give up. And he still attacks us and he does it through our families. And that is the place, Lord, where we find it hardest to be the people you've called us to be. May the Holy Spirit cut loose on us, Lord, this Christmas, and may bridges that have blown up be mended. May relationships that have been destroyed be healed. And may dynamic new relationships be formed with people who don't speak to each other anymore. We thank you that so many have already reconciled, and we pray, Lord, today that some good will come out of this. It doesn't take a lot of guts to pick up a phone and just say, hi, I've been thinking about you and I, I, uh, I wanted to just say hi and, and see how you're going. And Lord, that's an easy thing to do if we put self out of the way. And as we remember that Jesus is the reason for the season, we will remember that he is the one who is most important at Christmas. And as we bring Jesus into our hearts, we'll bring Jesus into our families. And we just ask that you'll go with us now as we might remember these things, be loving and kind to our neighbours, give them a little gift and uh, tell them that Jesus is the one who loves them and he's the reason for the season and that we wish them well. I know that would mean a lot. And we ask all these things only through the powerful name of Jesus Christ. May we go into a blessed 2024, not only receive a blessing but be a blessing. I pray this for all these saints in Jesus' powerful name. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you all.